everyone. I'm so glad you've decided um, to watch this video and try and learn a little bit more about sciences. Um, like I mentioned in my first little introductory video, I'm going to be talking about four sciences, and so this one is going to be about biology, which is personally my favorite out of the four sciences I'm going to be discussing. So I might be a little bit biased in this video, but I think biology is pretty great. Um, if you don't know what biology is, that's fine, because I'm going to explain it. Biology is basically the study of living things, and so that's obviously a huge umbrella term, and there are so many fields within biology that we can study, because we can study so many different types of living organisms and so many different categories of organisms. Um, for example, in within biology, you can study physiology, which is the study of like our bodies, okay? Or you could study plant biology because plants are living organisms, or microbiology, which is a study of bacteria and viruses and small organisms, um, or even genetics or zoology. There's so many different fields and so many more than I just mentioned that all thunder, uh, fall under that broad category of biology. And so in this video, I obviously can't focus on all of them, but I want to talk specifically about genetics because the experiment or demonstration that I'm going to be showing in this video is a demonstration with regards to the field of genetics. And so before I begin, there's a few things you need to know about the field of genetics to sort of understand what we're going to be going through in the demonstration. And so you guys might have already heard of something called DNA for short, which is deoxyribose nucleic acid for long. And so DNA is what makes up all of our cells. It's basically the code for our entire bodies and for every organism. Each organism has its own special DNA. And so in this DNA, we have something called genes. And genes are basically instructions that tell our cells when to make proteins, so, which are the things that make up what we are physically. And so we tend to think of everyone as having different genes, but the truth is, in humans, most of our genes are the same. Actually, all of our genes are the same, except for short parts of our DNA called short tandem repeats, which is something I'm not going to discuss too much in this video. Um, but a lot of animals and even plants like bananas share an unusually large amount of DNA with humans. And so everyone has the same genes, but the reason we are all unique and we look different is because within these genes, some of them are turned on and some of them are turned off, which can be a bit of a tricky concept. So I tend to think of it as like a giant house sometimes. If we think of our house being like the DNA and each room being a gene, you can think sometimes some rooms have the lights turned on and some rooms have the lights turned off. And sometimes we only have a light in a room turned on because we need it. And sometimes when we go out of that room, we turn the light off because we don't need it. And that's kind of the idea with genes. Um, sometimes we're not using them, so we turn them off. Sometimes we turn them on. And that's sort of what gives us all our characteristics. Um, DNA as you might know or you might not know, has a pretty characteristic um, molecular structure. It's what we like to call a double helix. And so that double helix is pretty unique, and um, uh, it's a unique structure. Um, and so before we start the experiment, I want to talk a little bit about women in science, and specifically um, a particular woman who helped contribute to the field of genetics, or DNA structure in this case. So in the early 1950s, there was a big race among the scientific community to try and discover more and more about DNA, the stuff that makes us what we are. And so we were trying to learn more about the structure of DNA. And so some people had the idea to use a technique called x-ray diffraction to try and determine what the structure of DNA actually looked like. Today, we know that it that structure is the double helix, which I was just talking about, but back then we didn't actually know that, and that's what we were trying to discover. And so 
a scientist called Maurice Wilkins had the idea to study DNA structure by x-ray diffraction, and it was actually his grad student, Rosalind Franklin, who successfully used that technique and successfully determined and proved that the DNA structure um, was the double helix shape, which is a huge breakthrough. But unfortunately, because she was a woman at the time and just a student, she didn't get much recognition for this discovery. And Maurice Wilkins later ended up sharing the Nobel Prize with two other scientists for their breakthroughs in DNA, whereas Rosalind Franklin was basically unacknowledged. So <laughs> that's kind of unfortunate. But she did make a huge breakthrough, and that was you know, almost 70 years ago, so that's kind of crazy, and it just goes to show you how women are totally important in science, and how we've certainly come a long way since then. So now we're going to move on to the demonstration, where we're going to be exploring DNA structure, but we're not going to be exploring it at a microscopic level. Um, so instead, what we're going to be doing is looking at the DNA structure from banana cells and wheat germ cells, but just with our naked eye. So we're actually going to extract the DNA from those cells and just view it in plain sight just to get a better idea of what DNA looks like. Okay, so DNA has a pretty unique molecular structure, and it's a shape that we like to call a double helix. And so that's what you're seeing in the picture right now, is that double helix shape. And so it's like that. It's like a ladder, and then as if you twisted that ladder. So you can see sort of what the rungs are, and those are what we call nitrogenous bases. And so it's the pairing of those bases, the unique pairing, that make up our genes. And so I want to talk a little bit about the discovery of the structure of DNA because it involves a female scientist who didn't get a lot of credit for her discovery at the time. Uh, her name is Rosalind Franklin. And so the story is, in the early to mid-50s, there is a big race in the scientific com community to try and learn more about the structure of DNA and what makes up us. And so a professor named Maurice Wilkins had the idea to study DNA structure by x-ray diffraction, which is a technique where you use x-rays and aim it at a molecule to get an impression of the shape, which sounds a little bit complicated, and it is. Um, but Rosalind Franklin, who was his student at the time, was the one who actually used the technique and managed to prove that DNA was that double helix structure based on the images she got from using the x-ray diffraction technique. Unfortunately, at this time, um, women in science wasn't a huge thing, and so she didn't get the credit she deserved for her discovery, and it actually ended up being Maurice Wilkins, her teacher, who got the credit and actually ended up sharing a Nobel Prize with two other scientists for his discovery um, surrounding DNA. And so that's kind of unfortunate, but um, that's sort of where the discovery of this double helix structure comes from. And the demonstration I'm about to show you guys in this video is an investigation on the structure of DNA. We're not actually going to look at it through a microscope, so uh, we won't see that double helix shape when we extract the DNA, but what we're going to do is sort of extract it from a banana cell and a wheat germ cell, and that way we're going to be able to see what DNA looks like to the naked eye, which I think is still pretty cool. So hang tight, and we're going to run that experiment right away. Okay, so to start the experiment, we're going to need about a third of a banana, um, this is Nina, she's going to be helping me out with the experiment, and we're going to use a mortar and pestle to um, grind up the banana so that we can get it a little bit more liquidy. And so she's just going to grind it up. Uh, we want to get it sort of as smooth as possible, and so after she's ground it for a little bit, we're going to add about 20 milliliters of water just to get it even more of a liquid consistency. Okay, so using the graduated cylinder, she's going to add about 20 milliliters of distilled water. 
Um, it's important to use distilled water because it doesn't have any other particulates in it, and so we know that it's clean. And when we're using a graduated cylinder, we always want to fill to the bottom of the meniscus, which is that little line you see there, that little sort of divot in the water. And so we can tell that this is clearly 20 milliliters. And so she's just going to add that to the banana that she's already mushed, and she's going to mix it up a little bit more. And what this does is it makes it easier for the banana to be filtered later on in the demonstration, which is ultimately going to make it way easier for us to be able to extract the DNA from the banana cells. And so she's just going to give that a good mush. Okay, so once she's mixed up the banana really good, um, what we're going to do is add 25 mils of our soap solution and 25 mils of our salt solution um, to the mushed banana. And so she's just going to add them into a graduated cylinder once more. Um, when we're using a graduated cylinder, another important thing to note is that we want to keep it flat on the table and go down to it to see the measurement, we don't want to lift it up to our face. That just ensures that we're getting an accurate measurement um, because sometimes our handshake or we might be tilting the graduated cylinder. And so we can see here we have about 25 mils and so she's just going to add that right to the uh, banana. And now we need to rinse the graduated cylinder before we add the salt solution. So now she's poured the salt solution and she's going to add that right in with the soap and the banana. And so now we need to stir it for about five minutes. Alright, so using our stir stick, she's going to stir it pretty slowly uh, for five minutes. Um, and the reason we're doing this is um, to open the cells and get into the nucleus of the banana cells, which is where the DNA is located. So that's what we're trying to access. And that's what the detergent does. That's what's going to open the cells. And then the salt solution that we added is going to separate the DNA from the non-DNA material so that it's easier to access and easier for us to extract. And so we don't want any froth. So and so now after we've mixed it for about five minutes, we're going to set up our beaker with uh, the cheesecloth, um, which is going to be used to filter the banana sort of mush that we just made. And so when we're pouring it in, we need to be really careful because it's not going to be able to fit in all at once. And we also want to make sure that none of the larger chunks that didn't get sort of mushed as well go through because that's going to make it harder for us to access the DNA. And that's why we're filtering it. So while our banana is filtering, we're going to use a scale and a weigh boat to measure 3 grams of wheat germ. So while we are mixing the banana sludge, we are also heating up some water. Um, right now it's about 60 degrees Celsius, so pretty warm, and we're going to mix that with the wheat germ. So now she's just going to add the 3 grams of wheat germ to the warm water, and we're going to mix that again for 5 minutes, which is just going to help soften the wheat germ, which later will make it easier for us to extract the DNA. So once we've mixed the wheat germ in the water for five minutes, uh, we're going to follow the same process that we did with the banana, and we're going to add uh, the salt solution, 25 milliliters, and 25 milliliters of the soap or detergent solution. And so this is happening for the same reason as with the other um, sludge is that we just want to be able to separate the DNA from the non-DNA and break open that cell so that it makes it easier to access the DNA.
and once the soap and salt solutions have been added to the wheat germ, we're going to mix it again slowly for five minutes. Okay, and so once we've mixed this for five minutes, we're going to fasten cheesecloth on another beaker and filter the wheat germ through that cheesecloth uh, using the same method as we did for the banana sludge. And so for the same reasons, this is just going to separate the larger molecules from the DNA which we're trying to access. So once you've filtered about 25 mils of the wheat germ and the banana each, you're going to add it to larger graduated cylinders, and then we're going to add um, some ethanol alcohol, which is going to extract So the DNA. we've labeled our larger graduated cylinders, and now that we have the filtrate, we're going to add each to its proper cylinder. And so she's just pouring it in. We want about 25 mils of each um, in each graduated cylinder. Okay, so our ethanol alcohol has been uh, waiting in the fridge for us because it needs to be cold for the experiment to work. But now that we're ready for it, we're going to take it out and measure 25 milliliters of it. Um, and then we're going to add it to the sludge or the filtrate. And so something important that we want to happen is we want it to be added on the side of the graduated cylinder so that it slides right down the side. So we're going to tilt the graduated cylinder and add it in. This is important because the ethanol alcohol is lighter and so it will sit on top of the filtrate which is going to be super important for the DNA extraction. And so we're just going to pour it right in and you can see it, that clear stuff collecting right on top of the filtrate. That's the ethanol alcohol going in. And so once we've poured all of it, we can write it up and you can see how it sits on top and that cloudy sort of wispy stuff's coming up at the bottom there, that's the DNA. And so we're going to give it a few minutes just to rest and float up a little bit more. Alright, so now we're going to use a wire to pull the DNA up and out of the filtrate and ethanol alcohol um, just so that it's easier for us to observe visually and so that we can actually feel the texture of the DNA and observe the color a little bit more. So I would say it's pretty wispy. It's kind of like um, sort of almost like scrambled eggs or like mucus sort of. So kind of icky, but that's okay. It's still a really cool experiment that we can actually extract DNA um, from the cells of bananas and wheat germs of all things. <laughs> okay, so we can see here our results for the banana turned out really well. Um, we have sort of collected near the top, very cloudy and um, sort of more like round, I would say, like like a cloud, I guess, yeah, and sort of a white color, and like I said, the texture is kind of like mucus almost. All right, and here we have the wheat germ. So I would say the DNA of the wheat germ looks a little bit wispier, and it didn't uh, float to the top as well as the banana did, um, but there's the same color and about the same texture. And so that wraps up the DNA demonstration. I hope you found that pretty cool. I think it is at least. Um, and so that is our biology video. Um, stay tuned. The next video I'm going to be showing is chemistry. 
um, which is also pretty cool. And then coming after that will be physics and computer science. So I hope you learned something and I hope you uh, enjoyed learning about genetics and the structure of DNA and learning about other female scientists from this field. Thanks.